Greg and Michelle are dear friends of ours, and uh, my wife, Corin, who's, who's not here, I'm doing this trip on my own, uh, also sends her greetings to you uh, as I was chatting with her. And uh, this is, I think this is my fourth time uh, preaching in a church. It's always quite a privilege that, Greg. Uh, I think, well, wow. Uh, you're, just, you're, you're just about exhausting things I've got to say. I, I, got, I only got four good preachers in me. <laughs> no, <I'm kidding. laughs> Um, but it is a delight to be back. I, I, love, I love the idea of, of building. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm probably not the cladding guy on the, on the building, you know, the, the pretty stuff. I'm probably the foundation guy, the, the guy that pulls some concrete in. And uh, I love that. I love that idea that we get to build the thing that Jesus is all about the local church, seeing the gospel walk through people's lives. What an absolute privilege that is for us. And so it is, I count this a real privilege uh, to be here and to be friends with this, this uh, wonderful couple who we've probably known for 25, 30 odd years uh, in ministry. And so thank you for the opportunity again. And I trust that God is going to speak to us. The funny thing is I'm not particularly prophetic um, uh, which may be uh, a bit odd to you because every time I come here, I seem to have something prophetic to deliver to the church, and I do again today. It must be you <laughs> <laughs> that are influencing me in some way. Um, but I, I, as I was praying for you, I felt the Lord uh, begin to speak to me about you. And, and the, word, the first word that he gave me was the word DNA. Uh, and... and I felt him speak to me about your DNA, that there was a uniqueness, there was a thing in you, a DNA in you, a strain from heaven, something particularly uniquely crafted. I, I don't know, when you look around at churches, I, I see a lot of ordinariness, a lot of sameness, a lot of, but I felt the Lord say about you, a uniqueness, a, a unique strain of DNA. Uh, from heaven, and I, and I wanted to say that that's to your credit as a local church. Um, but I also felt that that unique flavor and feel to you is uh, is what you're to give the world. There is a uniqueness in you. There's not a sameness, not a not an ordinariness of what comes out of you. You're to give the unique characteristics of the DNA of heaven that God's put into you to the world. Now. I, I felt with regards to your DNA, when you arrive, you're going to arrive in places. And, and I know that not all of you in this room are necessarily going to travel, but you're going to arrive in places in the world and your DNA is already there. I, I felt the Lord say that. So, you know, you, Greg kind of mentioned these words about you having gone airborne, you know, stuff that God's doing with has gone up in the air. And, and the, the thing about being in the air and the wind of God and, the, and it's, it's, it's blowing, Stuff's going around the world. Things are going to places that you've never been, but you are there. And some of your DNA is getting planted into different places, and you are going to arrive in places it feels like you're back at Northlands. It feels like, but we've never been here because something of your DNA has been implanted there. And that's part of your, the grace of God on you. There's something that he's doing. He's planting you into different places, and you will run into yourself You'll run into your DNA in different parts of the world. Uh, so be careful. Be attentive on the uniqueness of you, the uniqueness of this DNA. It's almost like the Lord is saying, be watchful because there is something that I'm planting around the world. I also felt the Lord speak to me about, about your worship. Uh, it, it, this is a season where God's adding to your team. This is a season where God is, is adding to you. He's, he's adding people. He's adding, he'll, he will add musicians to you. He'll add leaders to you. He'll add people to you in this season. And godly addition leads to a multiplied effect. Godly addition leads to a multiplied effect. There's a multiplied effect coming out of your worship. And I said this to you last time I was with you. And I'm reminding you that there is a unique sound coming out of you. Now, now, you may say, well, I, I I'm not sure there's any particular, anything particularly unique about our sound, uh, but I think God is bu busy developing a unique sound in you. Uh, I, I, I wasn't going to say this, but, but let me say it anyway. Uh, 
because uh, I, I, I mustn't hold back on this. This is there is there is an there is an album. There is a thing coming from me. I said that last time, but you know it's not going to be a, an album of prepared songs. There's something totally unique coming out of you. It's like there's an album of unprepared songs. Now I don't know whether that's in ten years' time or in two years' time or. But there is something very, there's a unique sound you haven't seen yet, but it's coming. And so part of this adding to you, part of what God is doing with you is leading to a multiplied effect out into the nation. So there's something very unique that he wants to do with you. And I, I, I thought I'd just give you a heads up. Is that okay? Um, uh, you, will be, you will bless the nations with this sound. You will. And then uh, lastly, I felt the Lord speak to me about the businessmen and women in the life of this church. And the word that I get for you is uh, entrepreneurial leadership, is what God said to me. There is an entrepreneurial leadership for the nation sitting in this room. There is something that, that there is a seeding of businesses in this, in this room. Uh, now, I don't, know, I don't know you that well. I mean, we've hung out a little bit. I know your leaders fairly well, but I don't know you well. But there is something that God is seeding businesses in the life of this church, and you will see that more and more. You will see startups happening, a lot of them. And they will happen on the back of you, men and women sitting in this room. There's entrepreneurial ideas and visionary things going on and stirring in your heart. It is God. I want you to know. You, you think, well, you know, must I step? It's God. God's busy working in you because there is something, there's a leadership here to the nation around entrepreneurial leadership. Someone here is sitting with a dream of enabling dreams. Someone in this room is sitting with the idea that my life or the rest of my life needs to be given to the idea of enabling other people's dreams. And, and I'm just here to affirm to you that that's God speaking to you. He, he wants you to be an enabler of other people's businesses and dreams. There's something going on in your life. You will find seed capital, and you will be the dream enabler of other young men in this room who will start businesses, and you will help them and mentor them and work with them. But you've done your thing, but now you're going to help other people do their thing. There's an entrepreneurial leadership thing going on, and it will be a great blessing to this church. Because part of this journey is that you will, you will be a resource back to the church. You will enable other people's dreams. There's a whole business sitting enabling dreams in this room. Uh, and leading businesses with godly discernment. Imagine that. Imagine God telling you when to sell and when to buy. Imagining that we have the advantage. I sat in this nation last time I was here, and the Holy Spirit spoke to me and says, I want you to go home, and I want you to put your home on the market. I want you to sell your house. So I thought, okay, fair enough. Where are we going? Well, we didn't know. We just knew we needed to sell our house. And, and then the Holy Spirit spoke to me and says, it'll be easy. You don't need to worry. It'll be easy. So we got home, and within one week, I had a call out of the blue from an agent, an estate agent, he says, do you mind if we come and value your house? So I said, no. Uh, it's not on the market. I said, no, no, we just, we'd like to value it. We think we may have a buyer for your house. So they come and value my house, and they value it at uh, nearly 10% over what I thought it was worth. And that afternoon, I have an offer for the whole amount. The whole amount. And we accept the offer. So I hadn't even put a sign up on the street. I hadn't even told anybody that it was for sale. The signed offer goes in. We do the deal. It's done. The money is deposited into the bank. And now we do the whole transfer thing. And the economy swings. The whole economy. Tanks. Homes are difficult to sell. It's a, it's a, it's a tough time. You know, God knows these things. Live with biblical discernment. Men and women, business leaders in this room, learn to live and work your business with, with godly discernment. You will sell at the right time. You will get out and get in at the right time. There is an entrepreneurial leadership for the nation sitting in this room. I'm encouraging you in that, in that journey. Is that okay? 
like I said to you, this is my fourth time preaching in the life of this church and many times with, with the leaders. And uh, I'm sure that in the course of kind of unpacking some things, I've spoken about many things of what I may again repeat and say to you today. But I have a bit of a prophetic kind of message uh, uh, today that, that really I could, I could have prophesied over you. I could have stood up here and said, let, 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 me, let me rather prophetically speak it to you because it's almost like that. Uh, there, is a, there is a message about change today for you. I feel God speaking to you as a, as a community about change because there's stuff that he's doing with you. And uh, sometimes we struggle with change. In fact, I've found in local churches uh, a lot of people struggle with transitions and change. When God wants to do something else and take you into a new place, the difficulty between the A and B is the gap is difficult for people. And I have personally experienced many challenges in my own life. Whenever God's brought me into a new place, it's not always comfortable. It's not easy to get into new spaces. Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1 really speaks about about this enormous transitional change in a man's life. And here, and here it comes. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Now, when we read the story like that, we think to ourselves, we hardly skip a beat, Abraham. 75-year-old Abraham. Now listen, I'm 53, and I lived in the home that I built I lived in it for the home I've just sold. I've just moved. And in 25 odd years of living in one place, I am totally amazed at how much stuff I had. Yeah. Aren't you, when you do a move? I mean, I had three truckloads of stuff carted away from a house that I didn't want anymore. It just, and, and I'm, I'm not a hoarder, and if you know my wife, she liberally gives away everything we own. So we, we don't have a lot of stuff. Uh, so, so I was thinking, oh no, this is easy. We don't have much, it's easy. And, and I'm still carting away three truckloads of stuff we didn't need or want in the new place we're going to. Can you imagine 75 years in one place? Think of Sarah. You know, the whole household. You know, the animals, the stuff, the things. Okay, we're off. We, we skip through these stories very quickly. You collect a lot of stuff in 75 years. All of us have these seasons of God in our lives that we go through. And I've discovered that even when people are in the most difficult of times, in the life of the local church. People go through maybe health issues, problems that, you know, cancer in their body or something really horrendous. And yes, God can heal them, but, but they go through this and they have chemotherapy, they lose their hair and they struggle and they're, they're in winter. It's hard, it's difficult. But even in the midst of the harshest winter, we don't seem to lose those people. Have you noticed that? They hang in there. They serve God. They're worshiping with the community on a Sunday. But the weird thing is, I watch more people get lost in these in-between transitionary moments when, when change is happening. Not, not in winter. In, in, the, in the gap between winter and summer, in the in-between in time, people get lost. And they drift out and they don't understand the change and they struggle adopting to what it is that God wants to do in the life of the local church. I want to suggest today that there's a space between seasons. Um, in my house, I have, I have eight rooms, not a big house, 
You, this may sound like a big house. It's not a big house. I have eight rooms. You know, three bedrooms. There is a couple of bathrooms. There is a lounge. There's a kitchen. There are different rooms, about eight spaces. But you know what? There's a space in the house that we don't count. It's not a room. It's a passage. We don't count it as a room. But, but you know, it's, it's a space. And, and the thing about the passages of our homes, it's the darkest place of our house. Passages don't have windows. They're between rooms. Now, you can't move from one room to another room without going into the passage. And we have the most trouble in the passages. Always. We struggle in the in-between spaces between the rooms. And there are too many people in the moments, in the interconnecting passages of local church life that feel disinterested, frustrated, bored, struggling with the passages, the gaps between the rooms, between the seasons. God wants to put something new into your hands. God wants to do a new thing with you, gift you differently, bless you. He wants to do something with you. But we struggle with the navigational tools to move between one thing and another thing. And often people get lost in the in-between spaces in the life of local churches. We struggle to let go. It's almost like God gives us something and, and we, we are, we are, we're enjoying this thing that we have. And we say, no, this is great, this is good. And, and then we need to we need to move on. We, God wants to bless us. He wants to do something else with us. He wants to change us. He wants to transform us. And we go, okay. If, if, I could just, if I could just get a hold of that, then I can let go of this. But it's not how it works. We think, well, okay. Um, <laughs> no. And, and, then, and then we have to let go because we'll never have that. There's a new season. And now we're in the passage. Yeah. Now we're in the dark place. We're think, well, where did the windows go? Where did the light go? What am I meant to get a hold of? And, and suddenly we become disorientated. I want to help you today. Because as a local church, God has much that he wants to do with you prophetically. He's got much he's pressing you into as a church. But for you to get into that, you need some help with the passage. Because you're going to be in it a bit. If you have a pastor like him, you'll be in the passage from time to time. If you have a prophetic call like you have as a church to the nations with a word, with a DNA that's going on, guess what? You are going to be in the passage from time to time. It's going to happen. And we can't have too many people drifting from the front row to the second row to the third to the back row and then goodbye, out the back door. And too many people like that because they become disorientated. They become, what's going on? What's, ha what's happening to my church? And they, they have no point of reference. Why? Because they kind of feel like they've let go of something. And, and now they, they don't know what to do. It happens all the time in churches. So I want to help you. Martin Luther King, one of your greats, said, Change does not roll in on the wheels of inevitability, but comes through continuous struggle. Change happens in these moments when we're in the in-between spaces and it's not easy. So let me help you. Let me give you some navigational tools. Now, Greg has a navigational unit in his new car and it's rubbish. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry to say, but it is. Because we're sitting in the car, we're going to Stone Mountain or whatever the thing's called. And it says, you go another, you go another three and a half miles. We think, but it's right there. We can't be going another three and a half miles that way because we're going to miss, we can see the mountain. We, we, need, we need help. If for, for whatever reason, this little system is just not picking up the right signals. We need the right signals. We need, we need some tools. We need some navigational ideas to say, ah, for us to be able to go there, we need to know that we are here. 
We didn't know that God's placed us here and that we need to get a hold of something else. That's the idea that I have for you this morning. So I want to give you some navigational tools for this season that you're in. Number one, have faith. See, it's really, really, really important to effectively transition into the change that God has for you into the future is that you have to live in the future that you're not in yet. It's awkward. I, I, I mean, I can give you an example. I, I, I don't do any weddings anymore, but I used to do quite a few weddings. And, and you know how it goes. You, you're all dressed up. That, that, I may not look like I, I do, but I, I do wear a suit. From time to I, I, from time to time, rarely. I don't like ties, I don't like suits, but I do. So I got the suit, I got the tie, I got the whole thing, and I'm on my way to the wedding, and I, I, wanna, I want some mints. So I drop into the local convenience store at the, at the gas station, and I walk up, and, and, and you know when you, it's awkward. Because you are not dressed appropriately for the space you're in. You're dressed for another space. And so we do the usual thing. We do, oh, well, I, I'm, I'm on my way to a wedding. Well, because we feel like we have to explain ourselves. Because it's, it's, we are inappropriately dressed for the circumstance that we're in. It's exactly like that. When you get into the passages, when you get into the darker spaces, it's almost like you have to, you're dressed for another space. You're dressed for another season that God's taking you into, but you're standing in the passage. That's what faith is. You need to be full of faith. Hebrews 11 verse 8 says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. In other words, not knowing where he was going, he went out. And by faith, he went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. You're dressed for a season you're not in yet. I, I, I love the story of David. I really do. I, this young man has so many kind of lessons for us. And there's an odd little piece of scripture in 1 Samuel 17, 34. And, and let me read it to you and let me tell you what I think about it. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, that's the end of the verse. That's verse 34. And he said, well, why would you read that scripture? Because one line strikes me as odd. I used to keep sheep. Have you thought about that? He kept sheep that morning. Came from keeping sheep. He was going back to keep sheep. After, you know, Goliath, done, job done, I'm the, you know, king in waiting. Back to the sheep. I think the sheep knew that he wasn't as committed to them as he was before. That's why? Because something changed in David. He's standing in front of the king and says, I just want you to know that I, I, I used to keep sheep. That was my... That's what I did. But I let, I've let go of the keeping of sheep because God's got something else for me. I, I want to live in another space. I, there's faith in my heart for something else. Yes. I used to keep sheep. You have to respond by faith to what God has said and not what you have right now. Not what you do right now. If you want like the GPS, I, I, I kind of, I'm beginning to understand where I am. You need to say, God's saying something to me, and then I need to dress for that. I need to speak that. I need to live for that. Otherwise, the passage can be a very disorientating and dark place, and your GPS can lead you astray. Number two, and I have a few, I think three or four of them. Don't bail. Don't bail out. Don't go back. Don't bail of the process. Too many people do that. Isaiah 66 and verse 9 says, Shall I bring to the point of birth and not cause to bring forth, says the Lord? Shall I who cause to bring forth shut the womb, says the Lord? There is a point of no return in the birthing process 
for those of you that have given birth to babies. You can't shut it up. You can't stop it and turn it around. If you do that, you have a dead baby. It's a disaster. You can't turn it around. Too many people try and turn it around. Too many people get stuck in the passages, in the birth canals of the new thing that God may, may want to do with you because you want to bail from it. It feels odd. It feels like you're pressed. It feels dark. It feels disorientating. Why must this change now? Why do I need a new job, a new opportunity, a new day? Why did I have to stop doing that to now do this? I don't get it. I'm feeling a little disorientated. I'm feeling pressed. In fact, I think I'm going to bail. Now, I've had enough of this. Too many people in local church life respond like victims to the circumstances of the change that God is trying to bring. They feel hemmed in. They feel like they've got to get out. And I suspect that there are too many spiritual babies around feeling, ooh, this is tight, this is difficult. I'm in the passage. The third point I have for you, the third GPS coordinate to help you in the passages of change that God's got for you as a church is see God in the struggle. See God in the struggle. Don't make it all about pain management. Many Christians respond to change feeling and seeing only pain. It's all they feel. Don't change anything. I'm in pain. Don't, don't, don't do that. Don't move me now. I've just got comfortable. I'm, 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 you will disorientate me if you move me now. And, and they respond with pain. Isn't it funny how in the life of local churches, people like that find each other? Yeah. They have little pain meetings. <laughs> little parking lot conversations about this or that. Or why did they have to do that? And, you know, why is the stage like that now? And, and, and why have they, can't they buy decent chairs for the back? I like sitting in the back. Can't I have one of the big chairs too? I deserve a big chair. Little funny, little pain management meetings that go on because these kind of people find each other. It's not the way it was, you know. Things have changed. Uh, we, we, you know, we used to be much more of a family, but now that we're growing and new people are coming, it's, I don't get to sit in the same seat anymore. You know, some stranger came and took my seat. I have to park on the back parking lot. I don't like that. It, it, it's funny how we, we become all about managing our own pain when change happens. See God in the struggle. There are two kinds of pain in the world. That's the worst pain to experience. People tell me, people tell me because I've never experienced either. One is childbirth and the other is kidney stones. That's, then it's the worst you can experience. I've never, and I never plan to experience either. <laughs> now, the problem with kidney stones he said, I've, I've, I've been in there. I've, I've, met a, I've seen a couple of guys in, in hospital, and there they are. And, you know, they proudly pull out that little, that little uh, white see-through thing, and they go, you know, there they are. See them? The stones. You think, I'm, I'm going to put glasses on to see them. I'm thinking, is that all you got to show for all this pain? Yeah. I would think it would be bigger. <laughs> right? But this is nothing. Too many people treat change in the church, and all they come up with is kidney stones. Nothing. It's, it's pointless pain. Pointless. Whereas, I ask every lady in the room, why do you have a second kid? <laughs> because there was a baby. That's why. There was a child. There was a promise. There was something going on. You didn't land up with kidney stones. You landed up with a baby. So you go at it again. So let's do it again. And some of you do it again and again and again and again. To all of our surprise. <laughs> 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 Do 
Too many Christians birth nothing but kidney stones. Pointless pain is their management of the struggle that they're in because they don't see God. They lost sight of the ultrasound. Just lost sight of it. I, I, my, my first baby, my, my son Luke, he's, he's 27 years old. And, and I looked at the ultrasound. And this is, a, this is 28 years ago. And let me tell you, that ultrasound looked weird. It looked like a bird in a nest. I'm thinking, there's not a baby there. What, what are we giving birth to? This, this is just like, there was this nest thing, and it was, honestly looked like a bird's nest. But the doctor said, can you see? And I, he had to point out, well, you see, there's the head, and there's a, and, and oh, oh, okay, there's a baby. There are too many Christians who are going through trans decision and change, and they lost complete sight of the ultrasound. They don't know there's a, there's a thing coming. There's a, there's, a, there's a God's in the struggle. There's a plan being birthed. There is a vision coming, and if you lose sight of the ultrasound, the pain makes no sense, and all you've got is a couple of kidney stones for it. It doesn't make any sense. Do not lose sight of God. Do not lose sight of the vision of what it is God wants to do with your life. Because only then can you endure the pain when you see God. What's the pain? Let's have another one. Let's do it again. Because God's got stuff for us to do, right? So don't lose sight. Oh, I'm getting a bit excited now. Let's calm it down a bit. No, number four, live in the prophetic, live in the prophetic. It's the word of God that will give life to the seasons of your life. What he has said will be the stabilizing influence of your life. Now, I, I have a morbid fascination. I really, you know, when you fly as much as I do, you shouldn't be watching these programs on discovery about planes falling out the sky. You know, five minutes to disaster or whatever they're called or air, air crash investigations. But I have a morbid fascination with those programs. I gotta watch it, I gotta see, why did that plane fall out the sky? And, and I remember one story where a pilot, this was pilot error, a pilot flies the plane and he becomes disorientated and he turns the plane upside down while flying. And then he starts to climb. And he climbs by diving the plane with its passengers right into the ground. He thinks he's climbing, but he's actually diving into the ground. And, that's the, and then goes the whole story of why did it happen and how did it happen. At the end of the day, it was, it was pilot error according to the program. You can't trust what you see. The GPS coordinate I want to help you with is so often we become so dominated by what we feel and what we see. You can only trust what God has said. Too many people come and say, oh, Pete, I've fallen out of love. I think my marriage is over. Well, the problem with your feeling is you can't trust it. It's unreliable. One day you're in, another day you're out. You can't trust it. What you have to trust is the instruments. You have to trust the word. You have to trust what God says. So when you're uncertain about what to do, lean back into what the scripture has said. Learn to be instrumentized again as a believer. Don't fly by what you feel and by what you see Trust what the word has said about it and live by that because a pilot that's worth his salt has to learn to fly by the instruments. And a believer that's worth his salt that handles transition well has to fly by what the scripture says. You have to live in the word of God. You have to live in the prophetic, what God has said about it. Your word, Psalm 119 and verse 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. We have to trust what the word says about it. So when you are in the passage and you don't know, oh, I'm uncertain, look at the instruments. 
Look at the instruments. Look at the word. Ah, it settles me. I can't trust what I see. I can't trust what I feel. But I can always trust what the word says. I can always trust the word of the Lord. The prophetic sense. And the last one for you this morning. And I know this is going to be a little bit of a stick in the throat for you men in the room. But act like a midwife. Act like a midwife. We have an oversupply in church generally of people in pain. Struggling with change, struggling with news, struggling with moving into new spaces. We need more midwives. Now let me tell you about my, the birth of my first son. When, when, you, when you have your first birth, you, know, you want to do it natural. It's got to be done. You know. now, now, natural birth generally only happens once. Then you smarten up. <laughs> but got to do it natural. So we do it natural. We had a midwife. We had someone who knew. And I remember at around 1 o'clock in the morning, Corin's water's broken. The whole process begins. I get nervous, very nervous. The bag comes, the car keys are in hand, I'm ready. We phone the midwife, she says, oh, relax, relax. It'll take a long time. I'll see you at five. I said, five, that's four hours away. I'll see you, at, I'll see you later. I, we must have called her, I, I forced the call on call. Call her again. I think we're in trouble, I think the baby is coming. But of course, the baby wasn't coming. It all took time. In fact, our son was only born at around 12 o'clock that day at lunchtime. We, we, drove, we drove to the hospital at around half past six in the morning. The thing about a midwife, she knows. She's seen it all before. Wouldn't it be great if the church was full of midwives? who have a prophetic sense and says, guys, relax. God's in control. We've seen this before. God's just trying to get something new out of us. He's just trying to get us into a new space. And, and don't worry, slow it all down a little. It's okay. Don't get all flustered. When God's trying to do something new and fresh and you have a new sound and a new thing and a new, oh, everything's new. I'm worried. No, no, relax. God's just birthing takes time. You would love some more midwives in the life of the church. If you're struggling with change, with adjustments, with the darkness of the passage, my hope is that you will bump into a midwife rather than the person in pain. Because people with malcontent, with pain, generally find each other and they start talking nonsense to each other. But imagine if men and women in this room who are going through change and adjustment, God is giving you a new business, starting something fresh, doing something else, moving you into new spaces, giving you new gifts, and there are an oversupply of midwives in the room who are saying, you know, I can see God in that. That's good. This is great. A baby will come. Just relax. It's all right. You don't need to get all worried and all concerned. It's coming. Ecclesiastes 3.1. For everything, there is a season. And a time for every matter under heaven. There are seasons. It's okay. You're going through a struggle now. You're in that in-between difficult place. But I'm here to tell you that it's going to be okay. Could we have more midwives in this room? I know you men think, well, I'm going to think of myself as a midwife. Ah, relax. We're talking about helping people with transition, helping people with change. And there will be some in the room. I have seen more people lost in the life of local churches, in the in-between seasons, in the transitions, in the change, than in the harshest of winters, in the most difficult of winters. So if you're in a transition, Hang with the midwives. Don't hold on to your past. Live in the word that he's already spoken to you. Get into faith again. Become instrumentized again. Become word dependent. Be refreshed 
from God today. God has much that he wants to do with this church. And this word in some ways represent a prophetic sense to you. Because he's readying you. He's preparing you. Because there's much he wants to do with you as a church. So I could end by saying, this is what God is saying to you. Because it is what God is saying to you. He's preparing you. He's readying you. Carl Bard said these words, though no one can go back and make a brand new start, anyone can start from now and make a brand new ending. You may be a bit of a mess, but the beauty of the transforming power of Christ is he sees the end. And you can have a brand new start. I, I, I love that idea. Your life may be a mess, your marriage, you may have had a couple of mess ups, things are not going well for you, but you can have a brand new start. That's the power of the grace of God. And you may be in these transitionary moments, you may have difficulty, should I do this, should I go there, must I take this job, must I start that business? What is it God wants me to do? And you're stuck in this in-between place and you're a little disorientated. Remember these points this morning, just remember them because it will orientate you. It will help you in the dark passages of change in your own life and in the life of this church. That's what God is trying to say to this church this morning. Would you mind terribly standing to your feet with me? Because I feel like the Holy Spirit wants to, as much, much, when much is given, much is required. And much is given to you as a community. And God has much from you. Much is coming from this community. You only just begun to see it. The DNA that you have is only just beginning to get airborne. But God has much that he wants to do with you. And what that means is that you've got to be ready for the transitions and the changes that he brings. So Father, this morning as we stand as Northland's church, this great church, this beautiful church that we love being part of. There may be moments, there may even be men and women standing in this room this morning who are struggling with things and battling with their own personal transitions and transitions in the church. I pray that we would see you want to put something new in our hands. You want to put new gifts in our hands. You want to put new marching orders in our hands. You want to bring us into new spaces. You want new babies to be born, new visions to get life. And so though we are a little confused, though we feel a little pressed and hemmed in and dark, we know, we know that we can trust the word. We can trust what you've said. And so we press through. We say yes to what it is you're doing. We say yes to the birthing of new vision. We say yes to the birthing of new dreams for this community. In Jesus' name, give grace to this people to live in the space that you're preparing for them. In Jesus' name, letting go of one to have another. In the name of Jesus, amen.